you turn to Leviticus chapter 6, I'm going to take one verse of Scripture as my text tonight. But the fire of God is so significant, and the altar is the place where we come to keep that fire ever burning. I meet so many people as a pastor, and they feel like they're on a lonely island. They feel like they're all alone, and there is, there is no hope for them. That's why this message tonight is so important. The altar is the place where we come to get direction from God. The altar is where you go and you do something so God can speak to you personally. Sometimes we come to church and we receive direction from a song. Sometimes the Lord, uh, he gives us direction from the message that's preached and Sometimes you might just get a personal word. Sometimes a brother or sister, they'll come up to you and they'll say, I've been praying for you, and the Lord brought you to my mind. And as I started praying in my own private altar, my prayer closet, God spoke to me, and God wants me to tell you that everything is going to be okay. How many have ever gotten a word like that, just a word of encouragement, you know, and sometimes people come up and they just put their hand on your shoulder and God speaks to you. God can speak to you so many ways. I mean, he speak, spoke to his prophet through a jackass. Then he spoke to the apostle Peter th through a rooster. I said, well, God, if you can speak through those things, you can certainly speak through me. Okay? But the bottom line is this. When all is said and done... All direction comes from an altar. Somebody has been alone with God, talking to God, and the altar is where you go to meet God. That's why I always want at the end of the service people to come to the altar. Some people, you may not know it, but they are not students of the Word. They don't read their Bible. They get saved, and they never go on into the deeper things of God. And some people, they don't pray. I know they don't pray, I'm not being critical, but I deal with people all the time. But the altar is where you come and you pray. It's where you talk to God. You, we need to build altars in our home, but the altar in the church is where you come for that corporate anointing. And the corporate anointing is so important because God doesn't want you to fight your battles all alone. He wants you to come and bring them to the altar where the fire of God has already fallen like it did this morning. And then God wants you to get into the midst of that fire because God is a consuming fire. And he wants the fire of God to purge you, to cleanse you. And we saw that this morning where the fire of God fell. And it's that fire that cleanses, that sanctifies, that purifies. And then sometimes God just has to get some stuff out of our mind and he flushes it out through the blood and through the fire. And then God speaks to us and gives us direction. But I want you to look at Leviticus 6.13 with me. I use this in, uh, in, in, in weddings, rather. It says, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. In the Old Testament, Upon this special altar, a flame burned night and day where God's people came to consecrate themselves and to worship him. The flame did not burn unattended. It did not burn uncared for. It had to be cared for, and that flame, that fire, it had to be fed. Every day, the old ashes had to be cleared away. Every day, new fuel had to be added to that flame, and so it did not burn by accident. Amen. And that's the way it is within our, our own lives when it comes to serving God. The flame of God's fire in your heart, it will not burn unattended. It will not burn uncared for. You will have to poke the flames. You will have to stir the ashes, amen. And you will have to tend that flame if you want the fire of God. I want to talk to you about the fire and the altar. Let us pray. Father, 
Thank you for the fire of Pentecost. Thank you, Lord, that John Baptist, when he saw you coming, he said, I'm not worthy to unlatch his shoes. He said, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And, Lord, you sent that fire on the day of Pentecost, and you sent that fire, Lord, so we would have passion. So, Lord, that our hearts would be ablaze with, with a desire to know you, with a desire to seek you, with a desire to serve you, with a desire to hear from you, God, so we could be your light, a light full of the fire of Pentecost, so we could touch the world around us, God, and we can carry your love to people. Let the fire burn brightly in our hearts. And everyone said in Jesus' name, amen. If you ever lose the altar, you lose everything. If you're going up in God, if you're going to hear from God, all direction comes from the altar. What a wonderful time we had yesterday at that prayer conference. We in World Intercession Network, praying for the nations of the world and praying for America because we are in perilous Dangerous times. And, and our government and, and our judges, our lawgivers, they have become lawbreakers. But I'll tell you one thing, God's plan, and I don't know, I'm, I'm probably going to have to preach this thing, but God's word is supreme. It does not matter what our courts say. When they say you can kill little babies, that's not what God says. God says that shall not kill. When they say you can have same-sex marriages, God says you can't do that. When they say you can live together out of wedlock and commit adultery, fornication, God says you can't do that. God has laws. God has a supreme law. And every law in this book is God's way of saying don't hurt yourself. Every command of God is God's way of saying I want to bless you. So do what my word declares. God is so much smarter than we are. It took me a long time to, finish, to figure that one out. I was 37 years old when I said, God, what I'm doing is not working. I mean, it just was not working. Now, you know, the devil is a stripper, and, and he, he can't deliver the good. He'll strip you of everything. He'll promise you all kind of things, and then he can't deliver the goods. But God... When God says, come to the altar, come to the place where the fire is burning, build an altar and, and go there and talk to me, God is doing that because God loves you and God is purposing great things for your life. Hallelujah. I, I, I tell you, I wish I would have figured it out earlier, you know, but, but God had purposed great things for me. God has purposed great things for you. But... If you're going up in God, you're going to have to begin at the altar. Look at the marquee when you come in, when you leave tonight. If you're sliding away from God, if you're drifting away from God, it all started at drifting away from the altar, not praying. God said, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. If you don't protect the altar in your life, if you don't take time to pray, if you don't take time to read this holy book, if you're not careful, amen, you will tend to replace the altar with carnal things. It's just in our nature, it's in our DNA, there's something inside of us that causes us to drift away from God. And every day you have to go to the altar. You have to remove those old ashes. You have to put new fire, new fuel on the fire so it can flame up. And you can burn bright for Jesus. Somebody go and praise the Lord. Amen. If we're not careful, church, we will begin to develop our standards according to the standards of the world. And the world... They are not interested in God. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, it is not of God, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof. 
but he that doeth the will of the Father shall abide forever. I'll take Jesus. I tried those earthly pleasures, and they all fail. But when I see the gates of heaven, I'll hear the master say, Hey, son, you took me. Come on in. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. But while I'm down here on planet Earth, I want to serve him. I want to go to the altar. That's why I'm a man of prayer. That's why I encourage people to go to conferences like we had yesterday. And Westmoreland was well represented. And everybody that was able to be there, they came away with their hearts ablaze with the fire of God. When we go to the altar, God gives us direction. God renews us. God refreshes us. God knows just how to do it. Woo! God knows just how to touch you when you need that special touch and that re rejuvenation that comes only from Him. Hallelujah. Hear me today. We need to come to the altar, and we need to keep the fire ever burning. Once you stop praying, once you start, stop seeking God's face, you're in trouble. If I do it, I'm in trouble. Once you stop dying to the flesh, once you stop dying to the world and dying to your own personal desires, you are in trouble. Amen. That's why the altar is so important. Because it's at the altar that the flesh is crucified. It's at the altar that we go back and, and we say, Lord, search me. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, I, I know you promised to keep me, but Lord, I don't want anything in my heart and in my life to hinder me in my walk with you. I want the fire to ever be burning in my heart, and Lord, I want direction from you. I, I'd rather have God's direction than somebody hand me a million dollars. What good is a million dollars if you don't have God's direction? What good is money if you don't have peace and joy? What good is money if you don't have the old account settled and you know your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life? Church, I'll tell you, we are blessed and highly favored of God. We say that, but sometimes we forget just how deep that vein runs. I mean, we, that vein of God, it runs deep. Amen. So jump into the deep waters and, and don't stop with God, you know, in ankle deep water. Don't stop. You know, the water also is a part of the Holy Ghost like the fire. Don't start with knee deep. Don't stop with waist deep. God said, I'll give you water to swim in. And God says, just like I'll give you water to swim in, I'll give you so much fire if you'll ask me and come to the altar. It'll consume you. I'm a consume, consuming fire, so let me consume you. Some people say, do you have the Holy Ghost? I got a better question. Does the Holy Ghost have you? Have you been consumed? By the fire of God. See, you will never reach the point where you don't need to pray. You will never reach the point where you don't need to die out to self daily and to the world and to sin. The scriptures tell us we must die daily. You got to keep the flesh crucified because the flesh is like a lion in a cage ready to leap out at any moment. You will never reach the point where your flesh is not trying to override your spirit. I've never gotten there. I, I, I was sharing a story at, at lunch today, and I was telling how I had been with David and uh, with Pastor Nick, and I was telling them how I had been in services for five days. I had been in prayer of a morning, church three times that day, and I had been um, in church praying that night and praying in the altars. And then when I got ready to leave that place, there was someone there that asked me, of the opposite sex, asked me to give them a ride. Stopped me as I was going by the tabernacle. I said, I'm a married man. They said, I like your car. I said, you do, it's my wife's. I gave it to her for Christmas one year. I said, I can't give you a ride anywhere. I said, I'm a married man, plus I'm a preacher of the gospel, and I can't give you a ride. God bless you. I'll see you later. Good night. And I left. And I was telling that to, to those fellows. I said, you've got to guard 
and you got to protect the anointing that God has given you. You got, go and praise God. You got something precious inside of you. You, you got an anointing from the Holy Ghost. You have power and authority, and you have the righteousness of God, and you've got to protect that, and, and you've got to watch it and guard it. And I said, can you believe that? After I'd been in church and in those services all the time, and then Pastor Nick got a, a word of knowledge from the Lord. He said, well, Pastor, he said, Jesus, said after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, praying and seeking God, said the devil came with his temptation. Isn't that something? Doesn't he come like that? What I'm trying to tell you is you and I, we got to get back to the altar. We got to stay in the altar. There is an enemy. He's called the devil, the adversary, and he goeth about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he has no respect of person. He'll do anything he can to destroy you. But you will never reach the point where your flesh is not trying to override the spirit. Even Jesus said, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I don't care whose bones you put it on. Flesh is flesh, and you got to keep it crucified, and you got to kill it every day. As close as the apostle Paul was to God, he had some struggles. He had to struggle with the flesh. And look at what he said in Galatians 5:16. He said, this I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you would. See, there's a war going on in your members, and if you feed the flesh, the flesh will win out. And if you feed the spirit, the spirit will win out. You need to guard. And you and I need to protect the anointing and the, 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 the covenant that we have with God. We have blood covenant. God will keep his part of it. But we got flesh. And we got to keep it crucified. God, and you can't look at the world and what they're doing. Because they'll lead you astray. And you can't look at carnal Christian and what they do. Well, they're doing it. Well, who cares? They're not going to walk where you walk. They're not going to get their prayers answered the way you get yours answered. People are not going to call them up and say, I got a problem. Can you help me? I see something in you. I feel something when I get around you. I want to know what is it inside of you that's so much different from the world. Hallelujah. Go on, praise God. Woo! Church, we need an old-fashioned altar because all direction comes from the altar. You know the first murderer that took place in the Bible? It was over a bloody altar. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, their nakedness, it was covered by the sacrifice of an innocent lamb. And they taught their children how to worship God at the altar. They taught their children how to receive forgiveness of sins. Abel built an altar. He knew this. His parents had taught him God is generational, and God had passed it on, just like God wants us to, to pass on what we have to the coming generation. If the Lord should tarry, they're going to need the fire that comes from the altar of God. But Abel built an altar. He knew that all direction comes from the altar. So he built an altar. He slew an animal, and he put his sacrifice on the altar. A blood sacrifice. And then Cain, he's jealous. He slew his brother. And the first murder took place showing how much Satan hates the altar. Because the altar is where we go where the blood has been applied. If you look at the Old Testament, Brother Philip was sharing with me after this morning message. He said, you know, when Abraham cut that covenant said he laid the pieces out, split them half in two, and, and there was a trail of blood there where they separated them. And, and he didn't split the dove or the turtle dove or the pigeon. They are just split open. They're not separated. And then God came down, and God walked through the blood, and God cut the covenant. 
Now, Abraham entered the covenant through circumcision. Now, God purposed to cut the covenant. It was God's idea. It was God's plan. That's beautiful. God says, I'm going to do this. I want to redeem man, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There can be no covenant without the blood. So Jesus, he comes in the Father's name. He goes to an old rugged cross. He sheds his precious blood. It was God's idea. It was God's plan so that whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord could be saved. And we entered into a blood covenant. And, and Paul comes along and says, Circumcision, it, it, he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is not of the flesh like it was with Abraham and, and those Jews back there. Circumcision comes from the Holy Ghost, and he circumcises the heart so you can be free so you can be clean so you can be pure what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that washes white as snow no other fount I know nothing 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 but the blood hallelujah God cut both of those covenants God planned it God did it and both of them required sacrifice. And then God says, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. What else was laid on that altar? Animal sacrifices. What do we do? We present ourselves to God. A living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto the Lord, which is our reasonable service. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the altar. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. You know, Abraham built an altar. Isaac built an altar. Jacob built an altar. Moses built an altar. And God expects us to build an altar so God, our Heavenly Father, can speak to us. Jacob was chosen by God. But Jacob had a problem with his flesh and with full surrender. He's like a lot of church folk that we meet. And he ends up wrestling with God because he's out of God's will. So many times people can't understand what's happening to them. And they want to blame everything on the devil. But let me tell you something. When you stay out of church, when you're out of church and out of communion with God, it's not the devil causing your problems. It's you letting the devil overrides you because you hadn't been to the altar. You hadn't been to where the fire is. You don't have anything to fight with. Well, you got the blood, but we go to the altar where the blood's been applied. Well, I got the word. Well, Jesus is the word, and he is the one that instituted the altar. So the weapons of our warfare, they are all tied to coming back to the altar. Look at that text again, Leviticus 6.13. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. See, it's not the devil causing all your problems. You get the fire burning on the altar, and you get filled with the Holy Ghost and fire, and you'll be able to cast the devil out, cast him down. Somebody, we were talking one day, a, a group of us, and somebody said, the devil came out of the fire. I said, no, he didn't come out of the fire. The devil can't take the fire. I said, go read that account in Acts when Paul was on that island of Melita. said, the snake... The snake came out of the heat. I said, he couldn't take the fire. I said, God, Paul, he bit Paul, and Paul was full of the Holy Ghost and fire, and he shook the devil off in the fire. That snake, that's what he represents. That old serpent, the devil. Amen. God help us. Too many Christians are out of God's will. They're like Jacob, and they're wrestling with God. Jacob was running from God, and he ran head on into the angel of the Lord. And he wrestled all night with the Lord, and finally the Lord knocked his hip out of joint. Sometimes God just has to beat us around a little bit. God's not like that, is he? Yeah, if you were his, he will whip you. Like my daddy used to whip with me. He said, son, I love you, and this is going to hurt me a whole lot more than it hurts you. I was wondering about that thing till I got my own children. 
How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. You tell the same stories to them. I, I, I've got to do this. But, but you know, I, I got real sanctified about it. I did. Because I felt anger sometimes. And I would tell my children, I said, I can't spank you now. I said, but I am going to spank you. I said, but I can't do it now because I'm upset. I said, when my insides are real nice and calm, I said, I'm going to come and I'm going to whip you. I said, it's going to hurt me a whole lot more than it hurts you. And they would come sometimes and they knew not to send mother. They, they knew that she couldn't plead their case with me. They knew that when it was said, it was said. And they would come, they would plead their own case. They say, Daddy, Daddy. Said, if I, if I, if I do right, Daddy, and if I say I'm sorry, Daddy, will you not whip me? I said, Well, I tell you what. I said, if you really mean that, and if you promise me that, I said, um, then I won't whip you this time. I said, but if you do it again, I am. And, and they learned to negotiate with me. But see, God is just that good. Didn't he say that to the nation of Israel this morning? They had sinned. They, they were not paying their tithes and offerings. And, and God said, return unto me, and I will return unto you. What a gracious, wonderful, loving God, full of wisdom. And all he really wants is for us to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, to be happy in this life, but to trust and obey. Amen. Jacob wrestled with God, and he said, I'll not let you go till you bless me. Now, that, that's some good wrestling there. And God blessed him, and he told him, he said, go back to Bethel. Go back to the altar where you first met me. I, I wished I could get the people that have failed the Lord, that have been saved and failed, and they, they're so hard on themselves when God says, return to me, and I'll return to you. God wants people to come and repent. God wants them to come to the altar. He loves them. He loves everybody. God is love. The devil's a hateful devil. But look at Genesis 35 and 1 and brother Jacob here. God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God. You see that phrase? Make there an altar unto God. God that appeared to thee when thou fleddest from the face of thy brother Esau. And God, man, Jacob, who's in trouble. He obeys God. He builds an altar in the middle of his circumstances. And God takes the entire situation and he turns it around. Time after time in the scriptures, we see God turning things around. And if you'll reflect back on your life like I do, you will see time and time again where you have gone into your secret prayer closet, made that altar. You've come to church, made that altar. You've gotten in revivals and made that altar. And you've gone there, and God, your heavenly Father, he turned it around. You know you can have a, a turnaround anointing. You can, you can walk in the glory. You can walk in that turnaround anointing, but you'll have to keep that flesh crucified every day, and you have to stay at the altar. Let the blood be applied. Amen. Sometimes we become so caught up in our success and our plans for our future that we forget where God brought us from. And if you do that, you're in trouble because one step away from God leads to another step away. You start out walking with the ungodly. Pretty soon, you sit down with them. And before you know it, you join them. And once you drop one service, it's easy to drop another service. And if you continue to drift away from God, pretty soon, you'll stop praying, you'll stop seeking God, and you'll become more engrossed in the world around you. You and I both, we need to protect the anointing that God has. John said, you have an anointing from the Holy Ghost. You have it. Protect it. I have it. We're to protect it. So it's important that you stay committed to God and the house of God. God said, don't, don't, don't forsake my house. But there 
of people who need to be here. There are people who we need their voices when we sing. There are people here that we need their service to our king. That there are people here that just their presence, we need them because we're a body. And guess what? They need us. They just don't understand how much they need the church because the church is the body of Christ and he's the head. And he said, when you come together with people of like precious faith and to get under the corporate anointing, he said, then, he said, if you'll come after the word or if I speak to you and you, I, I've seen them get up and run to the altar. I love that. Never bothers me. It won't bother my preaching if somebody gets up and says, Woo, I, I got to have it now. Glory to God. I said, man, that was some powerful preaching. Faith leaped in their heart. They got up, lip, lip, leaped to their feet and came running to God. That's what it's all about. Iron sharpening iron in the body ministering the grace of God to one another. Glory to the Lamb. I want to give you an old adage. Just tell you how important little things are in our lives. The nail, this is an adage about the lost nail. The nail in the horseshoe was lost. And because the nail was lost, the horseshoe was lost. And because the horseshoe was lost, the horse was lost. And because the horse was lost, the rider was lost. And because the rider was lost, the message was lost. And because the message was lost, the battle was lost. And because the battle was lost, the war was lost. And because the war was lost, the nation was lost. Little things, they do matter. All of that happened because of one nail. Do you know how important the body of Christ is to you. You have any idea how important the church is. Jesus loved his church and gave himself for it. He said, be especially good to those of the household of faith. I am careful what I say and what I do to anybody in the body of Christ. Amen. They're God's children. They're chosen. They have blood covenant. And I just do my best to help them. That's what I want to do. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to be a hindrance. I want to help somebody. Amen. Little things are important. Amen. It's the little things in life that determine the big things. You know, there are some old things in the church that are good. And there's some new things in the church that are good. But it takes the altar to know the difference. I'm all for the new. I'm open to innovation. I'm ready for fresh ideas. But in the process, I refuse to let go of the old treasures. There's some things from the past that we should never let go of. We should never let go of prayer and fasting. We should never let go of sanctification, holy living, and the baptism in the Holy Ghost. We should never let go of casting out devils, amen, and healing the sick. We should never let go of an old-fashioned altar. Oh, it may look like, uh, you know, 21st century. It may not be like they built them in days past, but God sees it, and yours it in your home it may not look like, you know, yours may be a chair. I, I got a recliner my wife gave me. I don't sit in it much, but sometimes I do. Amen. And it's in the place where I study, in the place where I pray, in the place where I talk to God. I've got a third floor, which is my prayer room. But I love where I work because I sit there and I talk to God and I study his word. And, and I've got helps and tools. And I build my altar Right there. God doesn't care if I get in a reclining chair. He doesn't. Amen. Probably wants me to rest this body more than I do. Mother used to tell me that. She'd say, son, even Jesus had to get in the back of that ship and go to sleep. You need to slow down, son. But that's just something inside of me, a flame, a fire 
a passion that drives me on. Hallelujah. And I want to be like old Caleb. I want to stand when I'm 85 years of age and say, give me that mountain, praise God. I'm just as strong as I was when the Lord promised it to me. And I want to take it. And I want to take all the territory that God has promised. And God has purposed. And God has planned. I don't want to sit down on the seat of do little and do nothing. I don't ever want to retire. I just need some rest once in a while. So I can get up and keep on going. And you got to get back to the altar if you're going to have a fire like that. I've got to get back to the altar. The fire shall ever be learnt, burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Amen. I want to look at these words that Jesus gave to the church. Look at John 16, 13. Jesus said, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he heareth, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. Jesus said the Holy Ghost, the spirit of truth, that he would guide us into all truth. Praise God for the Holy Ghost. I'm glad that there's some people in this church that if I preach something and I'm not rightly divided the word, I'm glad I have brothers and sisters that can come to me and say, Pastor, would you help me with that? I don't see it that way. Pastor, can we talk about this? They have the Holy Ghost. I have the Holy Ghost. We should understand good, sound doctrine. There's a lot of doctrine that's going to be coming out, and they're going to take it a new doctrine. The Bible calls it heresy. Amen. And they're trying to take the culture and fit it into the church. No, we need to take the church and get the culture in here and get the culture changed according to God's word. But if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. Holy men of old, they wrote the book, line upon line, precept upon precept. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. And anybody that's working out a new doctrine, let me tell you, it's not true. Now, we can get greater revelation, but we don't need a doctrine that tells us that, that you can be saved and live in sin. We don't need that kind of doctrine. That is not from God. God had his son pour out his blood on a cross, and God said, if you'll come to the altar... And if you'll confess your sin, you can have life here more abundantly, and you can have heaven too. But let me read you a verse of Scripture, because this is going to start coming up, and, and it, we need to be prepared for it. And I didn't have any idea I was going here tonight, but uh, it's Revelation 21 and 8, if you'll put it up. I hope I got that right. I might not have got it right. Look at this. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable, do you see that? And murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers, witchcraft and idolatry and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. When you hear someone preach and say that you can be a homosexual, and go to heaven. Know that Leviticus says that is an abomination. Know that Romans 1, 26 and 27 says they have left the natural use of the body. And they have, have given themselves over to do things that they find pleasure in. But God says I'll turn them over to a reprobate mind. They will not go to heaven. Neither will the fornicators and the adulterers nor the liars. Amen. Hallelujah. Go, go back to, to, to Revelation 21 and 8. I want them to see that. Because people will take Scripture and take it all apart. But I want you to know God has an altar. God has fire. God is a deliverer. Jesus announced 
his mission. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, recovering of sight to the blind, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and that is the year of Jubilee. When the trumpet sounded back thou, when Jesus Christ was crucified, glory to God on the day of Pentecost, and the fire of God descended from heaven, God was announcing an eternal jubilee. Glory to God. And you can be saved. You can be healed. You can be delivered. You don't have to die a whoremonger. You don't have to die an adulterer. My God, where is this coming from? You don't have to die a homosexual, a lesbian, or a liar. Because God says that homosexuality, men with men and women with women, are you watching by a live stream? Glory to God. Put it up there to the courts, the high courts, amen. Because this is God's supreme court. I know people think I'm mad. It doesn't bother me one bit. I come to preach the word of God. And I want the homosexuals. I want the lesbians. I want the drunkards. I, I want the adulterers. I want the liars. I want the fornicators. I want you to know that this preacher loves you enough to preach the truth. Because I want you to look at this verse. Zero in on that verse, Brother Baker. I didn't know where this thing was coming from. Didn't intend to preach it. But God wants to speak to somebody. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. If you die and you are not saved, if your name is not in the Lamb's book of life, you will immediately be ushered off into a devil's hell. If you're a Christian and you die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you go to hell, you'll be hell there. You will be held there until the great white throne judgment. And God will judge people. We, the Christians, we will go to the judgment seat of Christ, and he will hand out rewards to us. This is the gospel. This is the message of love from God. Eternity is waiting. It's waiting for each of us. And God says, if you come before the great white throne judgment, if you are a murderer, an unbeliever, abominable, the fearful, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, God says, you will burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. The ceaseless, endless ages of eternity in a lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so God made the altar. And God says, I want my fire to ever be burning upon the altar. There are people out there, and they need a Savior. They need a church where there's fire on the altar. They need deliverance. We've had two of them come recently, bound by chains of substance abuse. One of them's been here twice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But see, we need the fire on our altar. And if we got the fire, if we got the goods, church, then you and I, as children of God, will be the light. We'll walk with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We will be able to affect the culture around us. But the fire and the altar, they're important. If we don't have fire on the altar, if we don't have the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth, that applies the blood to a heart, that manifests the deliverance power of God through servants of God like us, you have an anointing, please protect your anointing. God says, put Leviticus 13 up there, 13 and 3. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. Do you see that? 6 and 13, I'm sorry. I said it backwards. 
Hallelujah. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Church, we're Pentecostal. Pastor Nick, we are people that God has given us tremendous revelation. And there are people that are going to be coming. We're in the last days. There's going to be more demon power than the church has ever had to deal with. And God has called us to the kingdom for such a time as this. I'm so thankful for the altar. I'm so thankful for people who will come and pray. Because church, we have got to keep the fire ever burning upon the altar. And the only way that you and I can do that, we've got to protect the anointing that God has given to each of us. Let us stand. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. Thank you, Lord, for the altar. Lord, help us to guard our anointing. Help us to protect it, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be vessels of honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, Fill with the Holy Ghost and with the fire of God. And, Lord, we just pray in Jesus' name that you will touch hearts and lives and change them, Lord, by your amazing grace. Let us all come to the altar and worship the Lord. I stopped early. we got plenty of time to worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Lord. Lord, we got family members. We got neighbors, God. They need a fresh encounter with the fire of God. Lord, it was on the day of Pentecost. When the fire of God fell. And Lord, hearts were ignited. And Lord, they went out and turned their city upside down. Let us be a people like that, Lord. That, Lord, your anointing is so strong. The fire is burning with such a flame that our hearts are set on fire by the Holy Ghost.
community, the various places we will go. God, let the fire burn in us. Let the fire burn so strong, God, that others will be drawn to the fire like a moth is drawn to a flame. Let the world out there be drawn to the church in these last days. Glory to God. Draw, Holy Ghost. Put a draw in Jesus' name upon us. Glory. Lord, I see Lord. What you have need of. You need that fresh anointing. Say, Lord, I need a fresh dust. Lord, I need for you to let me know that I'm yours, that everything's okay. God, I've come to the altar. I've come to obtain grace and mercy and the help. Lord, we pray for members. God, we're a church bringing hurting families to a healing Jesus. Lord, we pray that the families will come, Lord. That families will come, that they will come, Lord, where the fire is ever burning on the altar. Hallelujah.